Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is Kambiz Ranavardi, co-president of Columbia DC and a graduate of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. I also happen to be a former uh, member of technical staff that, uh, at the Bell Labs, uh, just like uh, our, uh, our panel today, uh, of, of course, uh, with very uh, more uh, modest list of accomplishments. Um, first, let me thank our partners uh, who uh, uh, helped plan and uh, promote these events, uh, School of Engineering and Applied Science, as well as Columbia Alumni Association. Thank you. Um, we are very privileged and honored to, uh, to have the opportunity to host a conversation with the 2020 ACM uh, Touring Award winner, uh, Alfred Aho, Lawrence Gossman, Professor Emeritus of Computer Science at Columbia University. And this will be in conversation with Professor Michalis Yanakakis, uh, Percy K. and Vida L. Hudson, uh, Professor of Computer Science at Columbia. Uh, please uh, allow me to briefly introduce our speakers, uh, but I would encourage everyone to check our website for, uh, for their full bios and a, a more complete list of their accomplishments. Uh, uh, Alfred Aho is uh, the Lawrence Gossman Professor Emeritus of Columbia Science at Columbia. He served as chair of the Department of Computer Science from 95 to 97, and again, uh, in the spring of 2003. Uh, Professor Aho has received the ACM Turing Award and the IEEE John von Neumann Medal. He's a member of the US National Academy of Engineering and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a fellow of the Royal Acad Society of Canada, as well as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, ACM, Bell Labs, and IEEE. Professor Aho's research interests have included programming languages, compilers, algorithms, software engineering, and quantum computation. He has served as chair of the computer science and engineering section of the National Academy of Engineering, as chair of the ACM's special interest group on algorithms and, and computability theory, and twice as chair of the advisory committee for the National Science Foundation's Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate. Our host, um, um, uh, Professor Mihalis Yanakakis, works on the theoretical foundation of computing, seeking to understand the inherent computational complexity of problems and to design efficient algorithms for their solutions. Uh, his activities include, uh, among other things, research in uh, combinatorial optimization, which includes developing efficient approximation algorithm for hard optimization problems, characterizing the limits of approximability, and investigating trade-offs in multi-criteria optimization. In algorithmic game theory, which includes a studying the computation of equilibria for games and markets and algorithms for pricing, and mechanism design in modeling, including verification and testing of reactive systems and in databases, uh, including a query processing and concurrency control. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts uh, and Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering of Academia Europea and of the National Academy of Sciences, a recipient of the Knut Prize, a fellow of the Association for Computing Machinery and a Bell Labs fellow. So without further ado, um, uh, Professor Yanakakis, uh, Professor Aho, please take away. And thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, me to host uh, this event with uh, Alejo. He's uh, Al received uh, recently the Turing Award, which is known as the Nobel Prize of Computing. It's uh, the top award in our field. And uh, this is a great honor for the for Columbia University and the Department of Computer Science. And uh, it's a great honor for me to uh, have this conversation with uh, Alejo. So I know Al for many years. I, we, I was uh, um, uh, worked with him at Belabs the first, he was, and uh, then uh, at uh, Columbia University, so it's a person I have admired throughout, so it's a role model for me, as he is for many other uh, younger computer scientists. So, uh, 
to start with, I would uh, like to ask, uh, I'll go back a little in time and uh, uh, I, uh, ask him to reflect, you know, when he was starting to uh, his studies, he, uh, I know he's uh, first uh, got his degree in, uh, in um, engineering physics at Toronto and then went to Princeton and then uh, uh, went into computer science. So I'd like to ask him, uh, how did you did, did he decide, uh, how did you decide to go into computer science, which was a young field at the time? Well, thank you for the introduction, uh, Mihalis, and uh, uh, thank you everyone for joining in on this conversation. It's always a privilege for me to be able to talk to Mihalis because uh, he and I have shared interests and I have always learned so much in my in conversations with him. Um, the question was, how did I get involved in computer science? Well, as Mihalis mentioned, I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto taking engineering physics. And for my senior thesis, I had done a paper on the minimization of Boolean circuits. And I kind of liked the problem because it was mathematically interesting and practically important. But um, I really didn't solve it to my satisfaction. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life after my undergraduate degree. So I chose the easiest course of action, and that is stay in school as long as possible. So what I did was I looked for where would be good places to go after Toronto? And um, there was always MIT, of course, which is one of the premier places to study computer science. But there was a professor at Princeton University by the name of Ed McCluskey, who was at that time the doyen of minimization of Boolean functions. Uh, he and uh, 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 developed a heuristic with Quine. So the Quine-McCluskey algorithm was the standard way of trying to minimize Boolean functions and Boolean circuits. And all I ever got from MIT were forms to fill out. And McCluskey kept writing me these personal letters saying, well, why don't you come to Princeton and study with me and we can solve this field together. So after a while, I said, why should I go to this university that treats me like a form when I can go to Princeton and study with this great man? So I decided to go to Princeton for my PhD. And uh, not too long after I got to Princeton, McCluskey left. Stanford hired him. And... Uh, what Princeton did was he uh, it hired this young assistant professor by the name of John Hopcroft to join the engin electrical engineering faculty at Princeton, and he became my advisor. And uh, McCluskey was not that much older than I was. He had only one research problem, and uh, thank goodness he gave the research problem to the second other student that he inherited from McCluskey. This was a problem that took the research community almost 30 years to solve. And uh, he told me, Al, why don't you find your own research problem? And that was perhaps the best advice that he could have given me because once you graduate, you don't have somebody giving you research problems to work on. You have to think about them for yourself. And in the first, uh, few year in the first few months at Princeton after I got uh, Hopcroft as a thesis advisor, I was tearing my hair out trying to find a suitable research problem to work on. But after a while, I came across the idea of trying to find a generalization of context-free grammars that could model more of the syntactic constructs in programming languages. And so I devised a formalism called index grammars and found that there was an automaton analog for index grammars, just the same way that uh, 
uh, pushed on automata or an automaton or an analog for uh, context-free grammars, and they recognize the same expressions. After getting my PhD from uh, Princeton, I um, finally had to make a decision. I need to go and find a job somewhere. So there was a place not too far from Princeton called Bell Labs that had just a fabulous reputation in research at the time. It was full of bright people, Nobel laureates. And when I interviewed there, my boss said, who, my boss who was Doug McElroy, the co-inventor of macros and uh, uh, had done some very significant work in uh, the computing already. He was a graduate of MIT, by the way. But he uh, said to me, Al, why don't you come and work at Bell Labs and you should work on what things you consider to be important. And I said, gee, maybe I can handle that job charter. And that was one of the best decisions I made of joining Bell Labs. My colleague and friend from uh, Princeton, Jeff Ullman, who had just graduated a few months earlier than me, had joined Bell Labs as well. And uh, I had just a great time at uh, Bell Labs because it was rife with interesting research problems, the opportunity to interact with brilliant people. So it was a researcher's nirvana. And I might say that I was very pleased when Mahalis joined the uh, Computing Science Research Center, which I had joined a little bit later because the people and the environment were as good as one could find anywhere for doing research in computer science in that uh, period of time. So that is perhaps a much too long an answer to this question of how I got into uh, computer science and how I got into Bell Labs, but I'm very glad I did. Right, yeah. Yeah, and uh, at, at Bell Labs, uh, there was, uh, I guess that was, uh, you went there, Jeff Fullman, uh, Brian Kernighan from Princeton went there, and uh, lots of uh, some other uh, famous people like uh, Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson joined. So it's, uh, it must have been a very exciting place. Where did you get your problems there? Was that... Uh, problems coming from the company, from the Bell system, or you would generate your own, uh, your own tools, your own uh, uh, problem agenda? Well, the, 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 this is a very good question and a very important question of what should you work on? And um, somehow or another over the years, I felt that uh, you should only work on important problems. And uh, I also, when I later became into management, thought that if you relied on your boss to give you research problems to work on, neither your boss nor you were doing your job properly because the most important research contributions seem to always be done by young people early in their career and that the whole purpose of management should be to get out of the way and give advice when advice is necessary, but let these young people work out these important problems. And uh, in the environment that uh, we were in at that time, the Unix operating system was just being developed by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. And uh, there was a, a new programming language that was being created by Dennis Ritchie called C. And I had a fondness for programming languages and looking at algorithms to translate programming languages into target uh, programs, compilers. So in this environment, uh, it was very interesting to try to develop both algorithms for use in programming language compilers and also looking at uh, new languages to create with which you can solve problems much more readily than with existing languages at the time. So I found the combination of theory and practice, the theory of 
programming language translation and the algorithms involved in efficiently translating programs in programming languages into target programs, a very enticing research area. Jeff Ullman was also interested in the same area and we decided to look into this area as deeply as we could. So one of the first things that we did was in some sense, a literature search of what's known about this field of um, programming languages, compilers and translators. So we decided that we'd uh, try to codify and put together what was known about programming language translation from a theoretical point of view. And Jeff and I wrote this two volume book, The Theory of Parsing, Translation and Compiling in the early 70s, which sort of took a look at the theory of the field. And then using the theory of the field, we decided that we could try to extend some of the theory, the theoretical techniques, the algorithms, and create with our colleagues tools that could be used to create components of compilers. And uh, we had some very interesting collaborations with some of our colleagues like Steve Johnson, who uh, was interested in creating a C compiler for a new language. And he came to me and asked, Al, how do you construct parsers, syntax analyzers? Uh, and this gave me an opportunity to introduce him to a method of parsing called shift reduce parsing or LRK parsing that uh, Don Knuth had invented at Stanford, except uh, Don Knuth's basic formulation of LR parsing led to parsers that were humongous inside. So Jeff Ullman, Steve Johnson and I decided to refine Knuth's LR parsing algorithm into being able to produce parsers that could be quickly generated and would be efficient. And this led to a tool that uh, Steve Johnson implemented called YAC. Jeff coined the term yet another compiler compiler for YAC. And YAC became one of the prime methods for con constructing syntax analyzers for compilers um, for many decades. In fact, YAC is still found in many different instantiations on today's operating systems. And there was another person who was interested in lexical analysis techniques, uh, Michael Lesk, and he had created a program for producing lexical analyzers. And lexical analysis is one of the first phases of a compiler. Uh, at that time, Bell Labs had a summer internship program and there was a very bright young intern by the name of Eric Schmidt, who took a look at some of the regular expression pattern matching techniques that I had created and installed them into the second version of uh, Michael Lesk's lexical analyzer tool called Lex. And that with the combination of Lex and Yak, you could experiment with front end, creating front ends for compilers for new programming languages. And these became sort of standard tools with which our colleagues in the Computing Science Research Center created many new uh, little languages. Brian Kernahan was particularly enamored of creating new little languages. He created a language for typesetting mathematics uh, with Lorinda Cherry called EQN and his model of developing a language uh, for typesetting mathematics was he should describe mathematics the way a mathematician would describe a mathematical formula on the telephone to another mathematician. Don Knuth, who developed the tech of uh, typesetting system, liked this notation so much, he incorporated it into his typesetting language, tech, and uh, tech and its derivative of LaTeX are used throughout the scientific community for typing um, scientific papers that have a lot of mathematics in them. And so in, I found programming languages to be just a very fertile field for 
creating new abstractions, experimenting with abstractions for solving problems, and also looking at fruitful techniques for being able to translate these languages into target programs. And as you're well aware, uh, all of, almost all of software is created by first writing programs in some higher level language and then using some kind of language translator to translate it into uh, target machine code that gets executed. So this was a very practical area. And uh, one of the things that I learned from the people at Bell Labs, particularly Richard Hamming, who said that in order to be a great researcher, it's necessary for you to do great research, but you have to teach others how to practice your research. So Jeff and I found that uh, writing books about the techniques of language translation and the algorithms that are involved in it was a very good way of trying to teach others what we have done with our research. And these books, as you may know, uh, Jeff had this idea that a book needs a, a great cover. So <laughs> he proposed the idea of having a dragon representing the complexities of uh, compiler design on the cover. And then the dragon would be fought by a knight in shining armor with a lance and the uh, lance and the various parts of the knight's armor were armed with the great techniques that we were investigating into compiler design. So this book got to be known as the Dragon Book. And um, it got written in three successive versions, first by Jeff and me, initially in 1977. And then in the mid 1980s, we were joined by Robbie Seti, who was a, another uh, member of the Computing Science Research Center as a co-author. Uh, the first dragon book had a green dragon on it. The second dragon book had a red dragon book on it. And one of the things that I'm particularly fond of is that the red dragon book was shown in the 1995 movie Hackers that uh, had a young Angelina Jolie in it. And when my children saw the cover of the book flashed on the screen of the movie, they for the first time thought that their old man must be really something in order to have his book shown in a movie because they didn't That's think really much of the books when they were lying around the house. Right. That's, uh, that's when it, uh, the accomplishment became real to the children. Yes. Right. Yeah. So the books, yeah, the books is actually one big, uh, uh, big contribution to the, I mean, not I mean, to generations of computer scientists, because, I mean, uh, both the Dragon Book, the Algorithms Book, and the other books have, uh, taught many, many generations of computer scientists. Is that, uh, how, do, how do you see the books relating to your research? Were they feeding off each other? They were, were they triggering your research or was that a way to organize? Of course, it's a way to organize to your, the knowledge to, to know what is to do next, right? Well, one of the benefits of writing a book is as you're writing the book, you discover that there are lots of open problems, problems that the research community hasn't addressed. So it provides a framework in which to develop a theory and a field. Uh, because if you're successful in solving some of these open research problems that you've uncovered as you're writing the book, you start to be, develop a reputation in that field. Um, so one of the advice that I always give to uh, new researchers is, if you get a chance, write a book. And if the book is successful, you will become known as a guru in that field. And uh, uh, I also uh, was teaching out of hours when I first joined Bell Labs at Stevens Institute of Technology. And I used 
my course notes to help develop some of the material that was going into the books. So I found doing research, teaching and writing to be extremely synergistic. And uh, this helped shape uh, my ideas, generate new ideas. And it also brought home the point that uh, it's very good to be able to communicate to your audience, both orally and in writing. So um, communication skills are very valuable for anyone, no matter what their field is. And writing books and teaching are very good ways of improving your communication skills. I remember the first, first time I had to give a scientific paper at a conference, I was petrified. I thought I'd be exposed as somebody who doesn't know anything about the field. And there were all these august people like Richard Karp in the front row. And I was in awe of them. But after a while, I discovered that uh, if you could explain your ideas simply and in a um, comprehensive way, uh, but in simple terms to a broad audience, this would also help in enhance your research reputation. So I've encouraged my students, especially when I came to Columbia, that um, uh, learning how to talk about your work and write about your work is very good for your career. So I forced a lot of the, forced all of the students in my programming languages and translators course to um, do a lot of talking and writing about uh, compilers and programming languages. They initially hated this, but after a while they said, yeah, I think it's very important to be able to talk about my work. And especially as they were implementing uh, their own programming language in a small team, that they could describe their programming language to their teammates in terms that they could understand was essential for a successful term project that they had to do uh, for the course. Yeah, so that I guess you applied that actually in the courses you were teaching then at Columbia. So in uh, 95, you moved to Columbia, to academia. Uh, was that, uh, what, uh, what were the factors that made you decide to make the transition? And uh, how did that change your life? Well, it is a, uh, that's a very good question. My life plan actually was to spend the last third of my career teaching and working with students. Jeff had a similar, Jeff Ullman, my colleague, also had a similar plan, but since he's smarter than I, he left Bell Labs much earlier and went to Princeton and then from Princeton to Stanford. So he spent almost all of this uh, uh, research career uh, in academia, whereas I only spent the last uh, third of my research career uh, in academia. I was also uh, uh, involved in getting promoted into management at Bell Labs, and I preferred to do research than being in management. Uh, so that may have been also a stimulus in saying, hey, it's about time to fulfill my life plan of moving to academia and teaching and working with students. And uh, I found my years at Columbia actually uh, very satisfying and delightful. The only thing I didn't like about Columbia was the two hour commute that I had from my home in uh, Chatham, New Jersey to a hundred and, uh, to Columbia in New York City through Penn Station. Um, but uh, I had a five minute commute from my house to Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey. So that was the downside of Columbia, but being able to work with the students and be able to interact with my colleagues at Columbia uh, made up for it. Right, yeah. And, and uh, you must have enjoyed it a lot because uh, you got a bunch of great teacher awards. So that's, uh, your, that's uh, something. Well, you know, that you were meant to do. <laughs> so, well, sorry. 
Uh, one of the things I might mention is that uh, in the, my favorite course, Programming Languages and Translators, I arranged that the students form a team of five and each team was to create their own innovative new programming language and write a compiler for it in the course of a semester. At the beginning of the semester, the students thought I was out of my gorge saying, not only does he want us to create a new programming language, but he expects us to write a compiler for it. But this project had two other life skills other than communication of learning how to talk and write about compilers and programming languages. Um, one of the life skills is project management. I had each team elect a project manager and the other life skill was teamwork. You had to learn how to work with your teammates. And uh, if you, once you graduate, you discover that in life, no matter where you are, you're going to have to work with others. So learning how to work with others is an important life skill. And frequently you'll be called on to lead projects. So learning how to lead a project is also a very good life skill. And uh, at the end of the course, I had the students um, write a 100 page report on describing the programming language and the compiler that they wrote. But the last chapter of the report was lessons learned. What are the most important things you learned in this course? Very rarely would the students say any principle or algorithm or theory about programming languages or compilers, but they, they would say such things as project management is a real, pardon the phrase, bitch, because they didn't realize how hard it was to manage other students. Or another comment was, I didn't realize it was so hard to work with other students. And I would then mention to them, but these are Columbia students. Wait till you graduate and you discover some of the other people you're going to have to be able to work with once you graduate. But during the course of the projects, if you do work on something very intensely, you get to know people very well. And one of the most fun and interesting projects I've worked in my life was creating a little language that got to be known as Awk with Brian Kernahan and Peter Weinberger. And we created this language just to help us out. We had a number of simple routine data processing problems of keeping track of budgets or uh, editorial correspondence or uh, grades, things of this nature. And I, I, use, I use to work quite a bit uh, when I run conferences, you know, to tabulate uh, results and, you know, so that's yes. it's, uh, quite a fun language, yeah. It was um, really uh, something that we wanted to create for ourselves and we didn't want to write uh, uh, several hundred line C programs to do this routine data processing. So we created this language, which allowed you to be able to express these data processing tasks with a few lines of awk code. And uh, we discovered that almost all of our colleagues had at, in the Computing Science Research Center and at Bell Labs had similar routine data processing problems. So awk became one of the most widely used applications on Unix in the beginning. And in fact, there was one person in the microelectronics division at Bell Labs who wrote a thousand line off program to implement a VLSI CAD system because he found programming in it so easy. So it also gave us an opportunity to experiment with how do you express algorithms, routine algorithms concisely and it also gave me an opportunity to use some of my regular expression pattern matching programs because we used uh, regular expressions to uh, specify uh, the syntax of uh, uh, strings and patterns. So awk is basically a pattern action language. 
you specify a bunch of patterns and associated with each pattern is an action. If you find that pattern in an input file, you execute the associated action. Human beings are very stimulus response creatures. If you hear a loud noise, you turn your head in the direction of the loud noise. So it was a very natural programming paradigm for people to learn. And uh, we just generalized the GREC program, which looked for string patterns to be able to deal with strings and numbers. And it's amazing how much of life is just strings and numbers as these yeah. patterns. And then the actions were little rudimentary C programs. And since everybody knew C at the Computing Science Research Center, uh, it was a very easy language to pick up. I might mention yeah. that the reason the language got to be called awk was whenever our colleagues saw the three of us, Kernahan, Weinberger, and I in an office talking about what to put into the language or how to design it, they go walking by the door and chant, awk, awk. <laughs> we couldn't do anything other than call the language awk after we finished. Right, yeah, so, so for those uh, that the people that don't know it, awk are the, the it's an acronym than the initial letters of the authors. Yes. Um, now, uh, looking uh, now forward, the, you know, the computer science is uh, by now, I don't know, 60 year old field, I mean, and uh, maybe more, okay. Uh, and uh, we, you and other pioneers have set the foundations of the field. Of course, it has grown a lot since then. Now it is, uh, it has, uh, computing has entered all walks of life. It's, uh, it's a much bigger enterprise than when it started. What, what do you think, how do you see the future of the field? What, what are the new directions? What is the... What? What is the prospects of the field in the future? It's uh, a question that I get asked a lot. And sure. uh, computer science wasn't a fully created field when I entered academia, entered uh, Princeton. It was just a program in the EE department, a digital systems program computer science departments were starting to be created in academia at that time. Now, as you point out, uh, almost everyone wants to study computer science uh, because they think they can get jobs in the area. Computer science has impacted almost every field of human endeavor, as you've pointed out. What's also interesting about computer science is that I think it's becoming more and more interesting with the passage of time because its applications to other disciplines create new opportunities for abstractions and how you think about problems. Um, I'm a big fan of computational thinking, a term that was popularized by Jeanette Wing in 2006 by her influential article in uh, the communications of the ACM. And uh, Jeanette and I have talked about how should one define the term computational thinking? Um, my favorite definition for computational thinking is finding the right abstractions for a problem area. So then you can solve problems in that abstraction area uh, with computation and algorithms. So abstractions and algorithms are the two basic ingredients of computational thinking. Well, abstractions and algorithms are also the two basic ingredients in my book of computer science. Uh, the first sentence in the algorithms book that uh, uh, Hopcroft Allman and I wrote was, algorithms are at the very heart of computer science. And uh, I think many of us, you might even agree with that because um, algorithms are everywhere. 
computational thinking has been expanded to try to apply to other areas of science, and in fact, other areas of human endeavor of what are the right abstractions with which to think about a domain, a set of problems, and then how to solve them using those abstractions. So as we look at computer science, and we look at where the field is moving, artificial intelligence has become one of the premier application areas for computer science. And artificial intelligence and machine learning in particular, a subfield of uh, uh, artificial intelligence is being used to revolutionize techniques for solving problems. Uh, artificial intelligence programs can play better chess and go than people. Artificial intelligence programs can do, in certain cases, better jobs of diagnosing skin elements than uh, doctors can. Um, AI programs can do a better job of recognizing pictures than human beings. And it's a very intriguing question of how far can AI and machine learning be extended? Um, one of the great problems in computer science from my perspective is, can we construct a chat box that behaves like a sentient being. Many, we look at uh, chatbots like Siri or Alexa, and we can talk to them in a very limited fashion, but there mm -hmm. is a lot of interest in trying to extend these chatbots into more conversational assistance that can be used by customers to query about products, order new products. Maybe in fact, they could be used to uh, educate customers and their users. We are still a long way from being able to construct chatbots that are equivalent to skilled humans who are supposed to help people. So lots of open problems in that area. If we look at computational biology, I think that's a fascinating area that's still open for lots of interesting problems. Can we construct algorithms for precision medicine where we can uh, design medical procedures and treatments individualized to people using the best knowledge that the medical community has available. And I think the holy grail, at least what I've been intrigued by, is can we construct a sentient robot that has consciousness? The big problem in this area is that the medical community or the neuroscience community doesn't have a good definition for the term consciousness. But maybe people like Christus Papadimitriou, who is intrigued by this question as well, will get some young students to make great strides in this area. But I don't know whether we'll get a full answer to what is consciousness, and certainly not in my lifetime, but right. ever. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a broad, uh, I guess, it's a broad question. So maybe we can get to some of the questions in the, that the audience has been asking. That actually relates to, to some of the questions. For example, there is one more question specifically about AI, but I think you have kind of answered it. And Tony Thompson asks, uh, where is it AI going and how soon will it get there? I think you have kind of given somewhat of a I don't know if you want to elaborate more on it or... Yes, this is, a, again, a very important area because <clears throat> if we look at uh, what is happening with uh, machine learning and AI, we're able now to construct uh, computer programs and uh, devices 
that can do jobs better than human beings can. And most of the time, these jobs have been menial jobs, but with the advent of machine learning and deep learning, we're able to construct uh, AI programs that can do cognitive tasks, often sometimes better than humans can. So with the march of technology in this area, what should we be educating students in so that they'll be employable in the future? The Israeli author Yuval Harari talks about this a lot. He asks, what should we be teaching so we won't put students into what he calls the useless class, people who don't have the skills to be able to find gainful employment in the future? I think this is a very important question for both academics and for policymakers to address of what should we be teaching for the future? I'm very fond of saying that uh, computer science, like many fields, is a field in which you should engage in lifelong learning. Uh, because if I only knew what I knew when I graduated from Princeton, I'd be absolutely obsolete at this point. And it's only by having interacted with the people at Bell Labs, done research, done teaching, interacted with users and customers that I've been able to gain an appreciation of where the important problems are and where we could extend the technology and in doing so, create employment of, for new products in these arenas. So um, this is a great question. Uh, I don't have a full answer to it, but other than to say lifelong learning, it's enjoyable, so enjoy. Yeah, uh, related to computational thinking, there is another question that uh, the audience asked. It says, um, uh, as co computation and co computational thinking becomes ever more important, how can we adapt programming languages to make them accessible to a wider audience? Oh, this is a really fun question because my observation is that if you get a, collect a group of computer programmers together and ask them, what's the world's best programming language? World War III will erupt because there's nothing that brings out the passion in programmers than discussing what is the ideal programming language or what is the currently the best programming language. It's maybe even worse than asking what is the best natural language in the world. There's no easy answer, simple answer to this question. But if we look at the development of programming languages, programming languages have been around uh, the major languages since the 1950s, where um, uh, Fortran, Lisp, and COBOL were developed. And even today, there is an estimate that there are 200 billion lines of legacy COBOL code that are still being used by banks, financial institutions, I, su I suspect, Maybe Columbia in its administrative systems still has a few COBOL programs that are still being used. So, <laughs> so there's an enormous amount of software in the world. And the search is for languages that are easy for programmers to write programs in, algorithms in, that solve problems efficiently but ones that they can readily write down. The problem with a legacy language like COBOL is that the language is somewhat broke. I could say a lot broke, that it's not taught in academia as a first language anymore. Maybe I, it wasn't taught as a first language very often, but it's an important language from a business perspective and legacy perspective, 
there is a great deal of interest in different styles of programming languages of whether you want an imperative language like Fortran where you specify how a, do, uh, uh, a task is to be done, what sequence of steps to take, or functional languages where you specify what should be done in higher level terms, but you don't specify how it should be done. Ultimately, it would be great if you could have a language that says, create world peace, and you give that to a compiler, and then now comes the program that creates world peace. But I don't think that's going to be possible, at least not in the near future. Not anytime soon, yeah. So talking about languages, another question asks, uh, uh, what is, uh, uh, let me see, where's the question? Uh, yeah. Um, actually, it's not there anymore, but uh, let me ask you something else. Uh, uh, there's these two questions are maybe related. One is, uh, what is important to you right now? And then there is another question. What are your thoughts on quantum computing? Okay. So uh, you can take either of them or both of them. Well, uh, having uh, retired from Columbia, I've been able to um, dabble and look into a number of areas that have always fascinated me. Uh, and um, one of the things that uh, interests me is is it possible to design a utopia, a form of government and a way of structuring society where everyone is happy? If I look at the state of governments and politics in the world, even in the United States, it's a sorry mess today. Is there any way we could fix that? But this gets into realms that I'm totally ignorant of. How do you orient people, persuade people to do the right thing, even persuading people that they should get vaccinated to protect themselves and their family? It seems like a difficult task. It sounds like a no brainer to me, but why are so people so reluctant to protect themselves and their friends and families? So let's go to something that's much more manageable, namely quantum computing. So quantum computing is a fascinating area to me because it uses a, an abstraction. A, if we go back to our thinking on computational thinking, the abstraction underlying quantum computing is quantum mechanics. This is a theory of physics that was developed in the first quarter of the 20th century to explain the behavior of subatomic particles. It's one of the most successful theories that physicists have developed. And recently, in the last couple of decades, people have been trying to use phenomena at the subatomic level to create computers that can do computation. But the model of computation in quantum computing is very different from the model of computation that you see in today's traditional programming languages like C, C++, or Java, or Rust, or whatever, because it looks at the behavior in some sense, the model of the, pr the principles underlying quantum mechanics. And here is why I think uh, knowing um, fundamentals is important. If we look at, say, Nielsen and Chung's um, Bible of quantum computation and quantum computing, they have four postulates that describe quantum mechanics. Um, 
And the first postulate says that the state of an isolated physical system, quantum mechanical system, can be described by a unit vector in complex Hilbert space. So you just have a vector in Hilbert space, and that is describes the state of, the, of a physical system. The second postulate says that the evolution of a quantum mechanical system can be described by a unitary transform on this vector in Hilbert space. So it's basically a rotation of that vector. The next postulate says that uh, if you combine two quantum mechanical systems, you take the tensor product of their underlying Hilbert spaces. I won't go into the details of what a tensor product yeah. is. And then the most interesting postulate is that if you want to get information out of a quantum mechanical system, you have to apply a measurement to it. And the measurement only returns a classical bit zero or a one, whereas this unit vector in, two to two, uh, in complex Hilbert space is the model of a qubit, a quantum bit, and it has two complex numbers in it, uh, two real numbers in it to describe its uh, state. So the mathematical underpinnings of quantum computing are very interesting. There's a lot of talk about quantum computing being the method of computation in the future, but we have a long, long way to go before we can realize this because we first need scalable quantum computers. Companies like IBM and uh, Google can only construct quantum computers with 50 or 100 qubits in it currently. And if you want to do something really interesting with a quantum computer like factor integers using Shor's algorithm, you need a quantum computer with a million or more qubits. So we have a long way to go to construct scalable quantum computers. And the other aspect is that we still need lots more interesting and useful quantum algorithms. So it's a great area to experiment with in coming up with algorithms for computation. So yeah. it's promising, but it's very much in its infancy and very few newspaper reporters and journalists really understand what quantum computing is about. Mm -hmm. So maybe that uh, relates to, uh, let me ask, uh, say one more question. Uh, and Gwen asks, uh, would you still work on compilers if you were starting out in the field today? And if not, what other areas would you explore today if you were starting out again? What do you recommend to a fresh student that is just starting now? Well, uh, what I would suggest to any student starting out is learn the basics of computer science and learn the basics of an application domain. So let's say we take computational biology. So learn computer science, learn biology, and then try to apply the ideas of computer science to solving problems in biology. Uh, where biology is still, re uh, has a lot of interesting unsolved problems which I think if we could find the right abstractions with which to uh, think about them and solve them would provide great benefit to humankind. So I would pick computational biology and I could go into much more details of some of the little languages that I had in mind for experimenting with computational biology that if you transpose two of the amino acids in the DNA uh, of a chromosome, what impact would that have on the uh, organism that develops? 
uh, I talked to a biologist on what do simple permutations of amino acids in uh, the human, uh, human DNA do? And he says, we can only do that experimentally. We don't know how to theoretically uh, determine what uh, impact it would have. So creation of new vaccines, there've been great strides in uh, uh, some of the MNRA technology but I think being able to devise new medicines, new vaccines, that would be a great application domain. So um, that would be what I would choose, but you should choose what application area you're interested in. Um, not everyone may be interested in biology. Yeah, well, so, yeah and that's computing. Uh becomes more important in more uh, different and more diverse areas. There is uh, the number of choices, it's only increasing. There is lots of other interesting questions. And I think time is getting now towards the end of the hour. And um, I want to mention there is uh, like stud a student uh, of your class that uh, has asked a question, uh, somebody that worked for you at Belcor and uh, commented that is uh, that was uh, the best time of his uh, his career or her career uh, so there is uh, would be a lot more to get to but uh, I, uh, I think we are approaching the end now it was a very illuminating uh, uh, conversation and uh, lots of wisdom uh, that uh, uh, you gave us and uh, I want to thank you for the conversation. I want to thank you for the audience for uh, their attention and uh, for all the stimulating questions. Uh, I'm gonna pass on the microphone then now to, um, to Cambis yeah. for well, concluding. The... Yeah, th th thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Yanakakis. And uh, thanks so much, uh, Professor Eho for, for your wisdom. I just want to quickly mention that the recording of this event would be uh, rendered and uh, and uh, uh, basically a link to it would be provided within 24 hours to 48 hours after this. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Uh, just one brief comment. Any any final comment, Professor Eho, do you have for us before we close it? Well, I'd just like to thank Mihalis for taking the time to ask these questions. And uh, I wish I could have much more time to interact and talk about the future of computer science, but uh, maybe sometime in the future. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much both. Uh, and uh, we close it now and uh, hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending too. <laughs>